Why Humanity Needs Science, Not Religion. Carl Sagan, a dose of reason. We've been on a dose of reason spring here. Uh, what a wealth of information. Great, great YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe. Subscribe to ours as well and check that bell. Notify uh, every time you, you know, get notified. If you don't do that, you won't get notified when we go to do a reaction. We're gonna be talking about Carl Sagan. We're gonna see what Carl Sagan has to say. And I'm sure there's much more for me to dive into about this guy. Listen, a lot of you go, wait, you're telling me you just heard of them? No, I've heard of them. I never studied them. I never listened. I never sat there and listened to lectures, watched videos about these people. I was the Christian fundamentalist who worked at the Christian bookstore and waited for the next apologetic video by Frank Turek and William Lane Craig and Ravi Zacharias and, um, you know, what's the... the, the the well-known, um, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. No, that's, that's Frank Turek. Um, uh, the case against the case, the case for Christ, if you will, Lee Sterbel and all these guys, like that was what I was digesting. I kid you not. And then of course I deconverted. And then as I deconverted, the stuff that I was looking at was more like critical scientific academic level material. This is more popular level skeptical thinking and Sagan was before my time. So let's not waste any more time. I'm going to check out this video with Carl Sagan and I hope we enjoy it. I and a few of my colleagues have uh, spent a fair amount of time trying to find some evidence for intelligent life on Earth. By and large, we've been unsuccessful. Would you welcome? <laughs> on Earth? Did he say um, we've been trying to find intelligent life on Earth? By and large, we've been unsuccessful. <laughs> Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan is one of three eminent astronomers of our time. A guide through the icy rings, strange moons, and storm-whipped planet, astronomer Carl Sagan. Carl, tell us about the latest, will you? The uh, latest is that uh, we have just made the closest approach to uh, Saturn. Well, I was uh, born in Brooklyn, New York. I was a small child, I don't know, five or, or so, and... Uh, even with an early bedtime in winter, you could occasionally see the stars, and uh, they seemed to me interesting, strange, remote. I asked people uh, what the stars were, and they said, uh, they're lights in the sky, kid. Well, <laughs> I could tell there were lights in the sky, but it seemed to me there had to be some, some deeper explanation. Uh, it seemed to me unlikely that there were just little lights, lamps hanging from from the sky who put them there what, what for mm -hmm. and so when I got my first library card I uh, fairly breathlessly uh, asked the librarian for a book on stars turned the pages of this you know easy children's book and uh, finally came to what uh, what I had been looking for an astonishing statement that the stars were just like the sun except immensely far away mm -hmm. that the sun was a star but just very close I couldn't tell how close the sun was or how far you'd have to move it to make it as dim as a star, but I could tell it was a very big distance. And suddenly the scale of the universe opened up for me, a, a very powerful emotional experience, which uh, I'm uh, still engaged in. The whole idea of, uh, of what happens when you read a book, I find absolutely stunning. Here, here's some product of a tree with little black squiggles on it. Right. You open it up, and inside your head is the voice of someone speaking who may have been dead 3,000 years, and yet there he is talking directly to you. What a magical thing that is. And now, years after Carl Sagan's passing, we're still listening to him. With words profound and visions vast, he unveiled the mysteries of our cosmic past. With passion, he embraced the cosmic dance, waving knowledge and awe at every chance. With science as his compass, he sought to unveil the secrets of the universe where truth prevails. We were hunters and foragers. We wandered in small, itinerant, extended families, chipping and flaking stone tools back before they had a little trickle of metal. So over the dying embers of the campfire, people watched the stars. And they did it, I imagine, for many reasons. One, it is just dazzling. And uh, we today living in polluted, under polluted skies, in cities with light pollution, 
have mainly forgotten how gorgeous the night sky can be. It is not only an aesthetic experience, but it elicits unbidden feelings of reverence and awe. I want to turn to the important and uh, rueful fact that every human culture has considered itself at the center of the universe. This is the geocentric conceit. Not only did every culture draw this conclusion, but I think it's clear that our ancestors took enormous personal satisfaction in it. Mm. The centrality of our position was stunning. We went on every human culture, every great philosopher, every scientist, every religious leader, thinking we were at the center of the universe. We put it in various guises in our scriptures, declared the scriptures to be infallible, thereby making it not just a uh, secular, but a religious crime to even think about the issue. I, I imagine an extraterrestrial visitation coming upon the earth and then listening in on what people all over the planet are saying. And they're saying, we're at the center, we're important, we're special, everything goes around us. <laughs> and then I imagine the extraterrestrials uh, thinking of us as, I don't know, the, the planet of the idiots. But that's too harsh because there's a resonance here between the most obvious interpretation of absolutely straightforward observational facts that every person can verify for him or herself, a resonance between that and our emotional hopes and needs. The idea that the universe is made for us, not because of any particular merit of ours, but just because we're here, or just because we're human. To me, this seems to resonate with the same psychic wellsprings responsible for the view that our nation is special and the center of the universe, and the same psychic wellsprings that say that our gender or our ethnic group is important and central and all those alternative ways of being human are somehow less central, less important, uh, less worthy than we are. We have a weakness. And I would say those of us worry about being demoted, those of us who wish for us to be important should do something important. We should make a, an easily understandable, achievable, and inspiring goal for the human species, and then set out and do it. That would give us the confidence that we sorely lack by being dependent on our self-esteem being based on nothing we do. We want to have self-esteem Let's make a planet in which nobody is starving. Let's make a planet in which men and women have equal access to power. Let us make a planet in which no ethnic group has it over another ethnic group. Let's have a planet in which science and engineering is used for the benefit of everybody on the planet. And my personal idiosyncrasy, let's have a world in which we go to other worlds. Human beings are in the exploring business. That's what we're good at. We enjoy the sense of exploring something new and it has adaptive and survival value. Exploring the solar system gives us other worlds to compare our own with, to better understand and control our own planet. We are exploring the deepest questions that every human culture has asked, questions of origins. In this case, where did the earth come from? Where does the solar system come from? Where do we come from? It is an enterprise which is peaceful, which is on behalf of the entire human community and which will be remembered for thousands of years. It is by far a bigger step than Columbus's discovery of America. The exodus of human beings and their robot emissaries to explore their local swimming hole in space. 
we have the ability to find out the answers, send spacecraft to nearby worlds, use radio telescopes to see if anyone's sending us a message from a planet of another star, I'd be ashamed of my civilization if we had the tools to find out the answers and refuse to look. We are at a very dangerous moment in human history. We have weapons of mass destruction. We are in the process of inadvertently altering our climate and exhaustion of fossil fuels and mineral, all, all kinds of problems which come with technology. We are not certain that we will be able to survive this period of what I like to call technological adolescence. Were we to receive a message from somewhere else, it would show that it's possible to survive this kind of period. And that's a useful bit of information to have. Life on Earth is uh, an expression of uh, the remarkable capability of certain kinds of molecules. The nucleic acids, uh, of which DNA is the most uh, famous in variety, um, which contains all our hereditary information, all the information which determines, let's say, what our children shall look like and many of their hereditary predispositions are encoded in a uh, language of about four billion letters, if I can use that that word. Um, and uh, and everyone else's uh, heredity is determined by a different sequence, slightly different sequence of four billion. He said if he could use those words likely because people use this as like, a, oh, it's a code, it's programmed like a computer, and therefore it's evidence of an author. You wouldn't look at a computer and say someone didn't build that computer, you know what I mean? In letters. The whole idea of understanding ourselves by looking at uh, at our relatives, and I don't just mean the primates, but all the way back, insects and before that, is exhilarating. I find it is so exciting, so broadening, so, and some people may think this is a misuse of the word, so humanizing instead of, of making me grumpy that uh, to discover that I'm related to the other animals, I think it raises the significance of human beings that we are so closely related to so many species and such a gorgeous panoply and diversity that the Earth's life is graced with. Here's this spacecraft that has flown by the Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune system, right? Is on its way, astonishingly, to the stars, a triumph of human engineering. We turn the cameras back and take a photograph of the planet from where it came. And there is our planet, <laughs> a pale blue dot. dot. A speck, yeah. That's us, uh, that's home, that's where we are. On it, um... everybody you love, Everybody you know, everybody you've ever heard of, lived out their days there. The aggregate of all our joy and suffering, <laughs> thousands of confident ideologies, religions, yeah. economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilizations, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every hopeful child, every mother and father, Every inventor and explorer, every revered teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there. Wow. The Earth is a very small stage in a great cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors, presidents and prime ministers, party leaders, so that in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of the corner of a dot. <laughs> Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one part of the dot on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of another part of the dot how frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds, our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe seem to me challenged by this point of pale light. 
Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that there's anyone who will come and save us from ourselves. That will happen only if we do it. It's been said that astronomy is a uh, humbling experience and uh, I would add character building. To me, this is one of many demonstrations through astronomy of the folly of human conceits. To me, this picture underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Thank you. This guy. What, if any one thing in particular, would you have yourself be remembered by? I don't know. I, I have to leave the decision about how I'm going to be remembered to, uh, to others. But thanks very much for the, for the question. His legacy endures like a comet's trail, inspiring generations to ponder, dream, and prevail. Carl Sagan, a luminary of cosmic delight, his work ignites curiosity forever alight. What is your memory of Carl Sagan? Please don't hesitate to subscribe to my uh, my friend here, obviously, at this point, A Dose of Reason. I also hope you'll subscribe to us. What do you remember him for? What did Carl Sagan do for you? What did you enjoy about this video? Comment down below. Comments help interact and, you know, YouTube rewards these videos for that. Make sure you drop a like. It's easy. Just press the button. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching this channel, being part of the community. It means the world to me. I really appreciate it. It means the spec to me, the spec in the night sky. But seriously, thank you so much. I really appreciate everyone. And until next time, see you then.